Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Catholic Truth Podcast, where we teach and preach the Catholic faith, which comes down to us over 2,000 years from Jesus and the apostles. We want to help you to know your faith, love your faith, and live your faith. And with a lot of confusion in and out of the church today, Catholic Truth exists to be a light in the darkness and a voice of reason and truth in this age of confusion. So you, anyone at anywhere, anytime can come here to know exactly what the Catholic Church teaches and why and how it can change your life. And today we have a guest and his name is John Salza, and he is going to be speaking today on the topic, the non-controversial topic of the SSPX. And uh, he was someone who frequented their chapels back in the day and you know, kind of lined up a little bit with their uh, ideology, and we'll have him tell his story uh, today. And I'm very much looking forward to it. But if you don't know John, he is a Catholic apologist, an author, a speaker, and he's the author of 12 books. Uh, his latest book is True or False Pope Refuting Sede Vacantism, which we plan to do several shows on in the future. Um, he has written over 100 articles, in, uh, especially in traditional outlets like The Remnant and others. He's a frequent guest on Catholic radio programs like EWTN, Catholic Answers, Relevant Radio, and more. And he's a practicing uh, attorney and a lay Dominican and an all-around good guy. So uh, we want to welcome John Salsa to the show. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, Brian. Now, John, I want to talk about the SSPX, and it's a very sensitive topic. You know, a lot of people uh, have heard both sides, you know, and there seems to be this controversy in the church over them. And I know that you, I don't think that you were part necessarily of the SSPX, like you weren't, you know, officially, you know, only SSPX, but you were going to their chapel. Um, is that correct? Maybe you can just start us by, uh, off by walking us through how you were involved with them. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, wasn't a member of the SSPX because you know wasn't a seminarian or or, or a priest, um, but I did attend the chapel um, for about 15 years uh, on, on the weekends. And it's funny, Brian, as I reflect, uh, you know, back way back in about 1999, I had understood that you know the movement of Archbishop Lefebvre was schismatic, and in fact, I even was on record of of trying to convince people not to go there. And then it just so happens about six years later, when I moved into a rural area and was close to the SSPX chapel, I said, well, I either have an hour to continue to attend the diocesan traditional mass, or I could go to the society chapel 15 minutes away. And I briefly looked into whether I could do that. And I, you know, effectively, superficially bought the arguments of the society that because there was a state of necessity you know, Catholics have the right to attend the old mass to save their souls, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of how I got affiliated with, with, with the society. I was there only for the liturgy. I, I really didn't take a firm position on their doctrinal positions. I wasn't really aware of them as I am today. Um, but I did get close to them and I did get close to a number of the priests. In fact, they knew that I was a Catholic apologist, that I was part of the so-called traditional movement, you know, to the extent that I was uh, doing a lot of talks on, on Fatima, the consecration of Russia, um, some of the aberrations that have been occurring in the church, the modernism, Freemasonry, et cetera. And so, you know, society priests invited me to speak uh, a few times at, at their seminary, at their conferences. So I did have a, a, a public affiliation with them. Uh, but again, I would say that I was not attending the society exclusively. In fact, when I began attending the society, uh, they asked me, hey, where, where did you come from, John? I said, well, I, you know, I attend the diocesan traditional mass during the week, but I come out by you guys on the weekend. And they didn't like to hear that. In fact, every society pastor that I had uh, at, at the chapel told me that they, they didn't approve of me going to the diocesan Latin mass. And Again, this was a long time ago, and, and even though I didn't know what I know today, I I completely objected to that uh, position. I, I said Wait, that. so not even like the diocesan yeah. English mass, or it was a diocesan Latin mass they were objecting against? Yeah, I wasn't attending the, the Novus Ordo. I was attending uh, a diocesan Latin mass, which was later taken over by the Institute of Christ the King at St. Mm -hmm. Stanislaus here in Milwaukee. And uh, they didn't like that. I mean, they're still on record as of today as dissuading Catholics from attending 
those traditional masses that are in communion with the local bishops. I mean, that that is, in fact, what, what the society's position is. Archbishop Lefebvre himself said, you know, when, when some of the society priests broke off and formed the fraternity, he forbade people to, to go to the fraternity. So all that, you know, was a very schismatic mentality to me. And so I wasn't in lockstep with their positions, but I was there for the beautiful liturgy. That was primarily my, my motivation. And so, you know, truth be told, I attended on the weekends, I attended the society chapel for 15, 15 years uh, while attending the diocesan masses uh, during the week. So, wow, I want to come back to the beautiful liturgy. Uh, uh, if, remind me if I forget, but that's a common argument, you know, like, oh, yeah. it's just a beautiful liturgy. And uh, one of my Sede Vecantes contest friends makes this same argument. He's like, you know what? I just feel so much closer to God now since I left the Ca Vatican Catholic Church. And now I'm, you know, a Sede Vecantist. contest. And it's just, it's a beautiful mass, the way it's supposed to be celebrated. And I'm like, you know what? Orthodox say the same thing. You know what? Schismatics, Protestants say the same thing with their guitar masses. Oh, I just feel, you know what? I feel like I'm fed now you know and it's just an emotional argument but we'll come back to that um what struck me is that um you said that well first of all they wouldn't didn't want you to go to a latin mass which is very surprising i just had a couple people on my channel recently telling them that they went to mass and their ssbx chapels were telling them that they're not allowed to go to the vatican catholic church and i can't seem to see how they think they're in union with the church when they don't even seem to agree with the church, don't want anyone to go to the church and think it's almost like an apostate church. It doesn't make sense to me. Not at all. See, they don't understand the threefold bond of unity, which makes one a Catholic. That is the profession of faith, the worship, and the governance. Now, the profession of faith simply means you've been formally received into the Catholic church. This is a common misunderstanding among traditional Catholics. They think the profession of faith is those who orally articulate the faith correctly. That's not what it means. It means that you have been formally received through baptism and the profession that either you made or your godparents made that forms the juridical bond that makes you a member of the Catholic Church. Then you have the worship. Well, the worship has to be in communion with the church, with the local bishop who's subject to the Holy Father. And then you finally have, uh, Brian, the governance of the church. It's a matter of divine law that one must be subject to the governance of the church. And if you think about it, the faith, the worship, and the governments are all based upon the authority that Christ has given to his church. And so you cannot use the argument that I want a specific form of worship, which then justifies me from withdrawing from the governance of the church. You see, it doesn't make sense. You either have the threefold bond of unity or you do not. You can't use a matter of faith or worship to justify separation from the church's governance. Yeah, very interesting. And I just want to point out right off the bat, just because you don't agree with the SSPX and you don't think they're in communion with the church, you clearly are not against tradition, right? You you said you're a traditional Catholic because I feel like one of the arguments comes up, well, you know, oh, why are you attacking traditional Catholics? We just want to have our traditional Catholicism. We just want to worship the way we want to worship. And they think that by disagreeing with the SSPX, we're disagreeing with Catholic tradition. Is that Does that hold up? It's absurd. First of all, there's a presupposition that the SSPX is traditional and orthodox, and that's simply not true. That, that's, that's the false premise here. The society is not traditional. The Society of St. Pius X holds heresies and doctrinal errors against the faith. So let's clear that up, and I can get into a number of those issues. But being a traditional Catholic, I mean, is what St. Pius X called it, right, is simply a Catholic who follows what the church teaches, who is in union with the church's faith, worship, and governance. So that's how I would define a traditional Catholic not one who subjectively interprets tradition, you know, independently of the magisterium, who is the sole repository and authentic interpreter of tradition. That's what a traditional Catholic is. Yeah, some people have been trying to make the argument to me recently that, uh, you know, well, the, the Latin mass is a lot older than the new mass, you know, so we should go with the tradition of the church. And I was saying, well, that doesn't make sense because there's masses that are older than the Latin mass, you know, and the Latin mass is not the original mass. So by that logic, we shouldn't even be going by the Latin mass. And it does, it doesn't make sense. Well, it begs a more fundamental question in my mind, and, and that is the fact that the Pope is the supreme authority in the church. And so he has the authority, the supreme authority, not only on matters of faith and morals, but also on discipline and governance of the church. 
Now, whether or not one subjectively thinks that he's abusing his authority is not relevant to the fact that one must be in submission to that authority and leave the rest to God, you see? So there again, there's this error within the traditional movement that is attempting to divorce the faith from the governance and the worship from the governance. But again, it's a threefold bond of unity based on faith and charity that exists without which one's not part of the Catholic Church. Now, you were part of the uh, SSPX chapel going to their masses for 15 years. They tried to dissuade you from uh, going to Latin mass, which is surprising. Uh, at some point, you must have started to see some of the problems uh, in addition to that. You know, you said that was concerning. Uh, what would you say some of the biggest problems with the SSPX movement are? Well, it's funny, Brian, how it happened. You know, we, we you mentioned we wrote this book, True or False Pope, Robert Sisko and I'm my co-author. As I began working on the second edition, I was tackling the concepts of canonical mission and supply jurisdiction. I began writing a new chapter uh, on those key topics. And it's there where I discovered that, wait a minute, all of the arguments uh, that prove that the state of the contests are not part of the Catholic Church are the very same arguments that are now beginning to show me that the society is not part of the Catholic Church. And it goes to the, the issue of what's Pius XII called juridical mission. It's a matter of divine law that uh, a Catholic minister must be sent by lawful authority. This goes to God himself as the Father sends the Son, the Son sends the Apostles, and the source of all mission on earth is the Holy Father who sends the bishop and then the bishop sends the priests. And this has been repeated throughout the church's history because it's a matter of divine law. And, you know, I began reading encyclicals from Pius XII who, who says those bishops who haven't been lawfully sent, you know, he, he calls them thieves and robbers and their sacraments are criminal and sacrilegious. And I, and I said, wow, I mean, this not only applies to the city of the contest, but it applies to the society, it applies to the old Catholics, it applies to the independents, it applies to all of these groups that are legally separated from the Roman Catholic Church. And, you know, the argument that always kept coming up is, well, there's a necessity, there's an emergency, there's a crisis, and therefore the society is justified in doing everything it's doing, which, by the way, begs the very question of why we can't save our souls without the society in the 62 missile, which is absurd. But the problem, Brian, with that argument is that you cannot use necessity or emergency or crisis to circumvent the divine law. The divine law of mission foresees all things. And thus, anyone who has not been sent by Christ and by his vicar is not lawfully sent. And whoever says otherwise, according to the Council of Trent, is anathema. And this is why the church has always said, if you haven't been lawfully sent, prove Christ sent you directly and prove that through miracles. Otherwise, you must be rejected as a thief and a robber. So the divine law of mission cannot contradict divine law. It cannot contradict the salvation of souls because the divine law of mission exists precisely to save souls, you see? So it's the emergency argument that falls on its face when we properly understand that mission is a matter of the divine positive law of Jesus Christ. And anybody can subjectively interpret that. I mean, I mean, has there been a bigger crisis than after the Council of Nicaea for the next 75 years when there were only a handful of good priests left in the church? The other ones were killed or exiled or heretical or, you know, there were not that many good priests left. And yet God saved his church. You know, you someone... Right. Yeah, you said God saved it, which shows you're thinking in the, with the census catholicus, man didn't save it. We didn't rely upon somebody who was outside the church, right, who was not legally united to the church to save the church. God would never will for a minister who does not have a canonical mission from the church to save the church. On its face, it's completely absurd. Yeah, and if anyone oh, well, actually wants to read it, I have uh, this six-volume history book set is uh, the history of Christendom, and it goes into extensive length about how the problems after the Council of Nicaea. People act like the you know oh Vatican II is bad. Look at the fruit. You know, look at half the councils in the church, and you see negative fruit afterwards. Especially Nicaea, it got way worse after Nicaea before it got better, and um, it, it 
the war and Carol makes it sound like the whole church was about to apostatize, but then God came in and inspired a few saints who've just poured like waterfall, converted converts, especially St. Patrick uh, in, in Ireland and poured back into the Roman empire and just converted everyone. I mean, Jesus said in John 16, that he's going to send his Holy spirit to guide it into all truth, not some truth, all truth. And in Matthew 16, 19, he said, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And in Matthew 28, 19, he says that he will be with his church until the end of time. And I feel like some people are doubting this. Uh, you know, someone once said that the, the SS SPX could be a very powerful force to fight modernism and liberalism, which we all want to do. But doing it the right way in the church, it could be a powerful force against liberalism and modernism. But outside the church, the way they're doing it, they're just adding to the problem the same way city vacantists are. Well, yes. And they start by actually rejecting the divine law, which requires ministers to be sent by lawful authority. They reject the profession of faith of John Paul II, 1989, a universal profession that's required to be uh, professed by all Catholics. They accuse Holy Mother Church of heresy. They accuse Holy Mother Church of giving an evil right, which leads souls to perdition. Archbishop Lefebvre repeatedly accused the Roman Catholic Church of no longer being Catholic, that is, of defecting and teaching a new religion and on and on and on. This is not the way one champions you know, souls and, and leads them into the church. This only leads souls away from the church. So how can they claim to be in communion with the church if they clearly say that the Pope is in heresy and the church is in heresy and you can't have the Vatican II Council? That whole council just needs to go and, and on and on and on. They can claim it, Brian, because they have a false Protestant ecclesiology. Okay, they've embraced the ecclesiology of the church, the nature of the church, the understanding of the church, whereby the church is redefined as a body of those who simply profess the true faith. And according to this definition, what they mean by that is that those who attend the old mass and reject Vatican II and the new mass. This is effectively what they've reduced the, the understanding of the Catholic Church to be, simply a spiritual reality, if you will, of those who profess the true faith, who adhere to the 1962 Missal, and who reject all the reforms of Vatican II. Well, that's not the definition of the church. As we said, the definition of the church is a juridical, hierarchical, visible social unit to which, as you mentioned, the gates of hell will not prevail. All the promises of Christ apply to this visible, hierarchical, juridical society, which is the Catholic Church. The members come and go throughout time, but the entity, the institution, the structure itself remains the same. And it's only through that structure that we have the tradition of the church, the faith, the worship, and the governance. They don't believe that, at least it's not what they practically believe, although they may profess that they don't practically live it because they, by their own will have refused submission to the Roman Pontiff and it's separated from the governments of the church. It, it sounds exactly like the city of a contest line of argumentation to me once you get into that ecclesiology. It is, although it's uh, less consistent because while the city of a contest are actually, in my view, heretics in the traditional sense of the word, because they reject the primacy, they reject the indefectibility and the apostolicity of the church by claiming we don't have a pope, we haven't for generations, we don't have ordinary jurisdiction of the church and so forth. The society, the society will claim that, well, those offices exist and they're lawfully filled, but we don't have to obey anything they say in practice. That is a completely inconsistent position. The society of the contest, ironically, in my view, would be more consistent because they simply do not believe that these offices are being lawfully held and hence do not have to submit. On the other hand, the society believes that the offices of the primacy and the episcopacy are lawfully held by Catholic ministers, but they are somehow justified because of their fabrication of necessity. They're justified from withdrawing submission from their authority. And that's entirely inconsistent because as Vatican I clearly teaches, all men, no matter what rank, no matter what dignity, are subject to the supreme authority of the Roman pontiff on not only matters of faith and worship, but also on matters of, of governance of the church. What are some other problems that you have found with the SSPX? You know, what are some other gaping uh, issues they have? Yeah, when I was telling you, Brian, I was researching, you know, canonical mission and, and jurisdiction. Uh, what I discovered, which is extremely problematic, is that their arguments for the last, what, 47 years on supplied jurisdiction are completely and totally misrepresented. 
um, the society's position on supply jurisdiction is effectively that any validly ordained priest who puts on a stole and goes into a confessional will have jurisdiction supplied to him by the church because a Catholic would believe that that priest had the faculty to absolve. That is not true at all. That is not at all the way the canonists have taught what supplied jurisdiction means. And this is very significant because up until the point where Pope Francis granted faculties to the Society for Confessions, their confessions for the past 47 years have been invalid and their marriages have been invalid because supplied jurisdiction does not apply to those communities who are outside union with the local bishop, number one. They all, the, the, the supply jurisdiction is triggered uh, in generally what's called common error. If there is common error by the Catholic community, that is by the community who is the, the beneficiary of bishops and priests with mission, right, which wouldn't be a society chapel, but a Catholic community, if a Catholic community would erroneously believe that the priest in their church, their diocesan church, let's say, was actually sent by the bishop, okay, who had faculties to absolve and so forth, then the church would supply that priest jurisdiction, even if the priest didn't have it, because the Catholic community is the one that's, that's to be protected by the church, and they had a concrete basis for believing that the priest who comes to a diocesan church was, of course, sent by the diocesan bishop. You see, that's where supply jurisdiction comes into place. The society is totally and completely misrepresented how a supply jurisdiction operates. They look at supply jurisdiction in a vacuum and say, whoever is validly ordained and puts on a stole gets supply jurisdiction. The truth is just the opposite. The church is extremely strict historically in her application of when the church would supply in circumstances where the priest actually would not have jurisdiction. Can you talk about, there's a whole lot more problems. We could do a whole show on just the problems in the SSPX, but maybe you could talk about some of the um, errors and problems of Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre. Um, you know, what was his deal and, you know, what were his biggest issues do you, did you find? Well, there, there are so many. Uh, it's, it's hard to know where, where to begin. I mean, you know, we can simply start by saying he denied the Council of Trent's teaching that ministers have to be lawfully sent and whoever says otherwise let him be anathema all right he denied the vatican one council's teaching that all us are subject to the supreme authority of the church which is a de fide teaching and which is a matter of salvation uh he had denied the second vatican council's teaching doctrinal teaching on the episcopacy um, which holds that uh, when the bishops are in hierarchical communion with the Holy Father, they share in his supreme authority. This is, for example, how they can be judges at ecumenical councils. Um, you know, I, I think one of the biggest proofs of their schism, and we haven't talked about that yet, but his errors, which led to schism, was the fact that he declared uh, after the consecrations that he needed, quote, substitute authorities to rule and govern the adherence of the society. And hence, this led to this formation of what they call this St. Charles Borromeo, quote, canonical commission, which is nothing more than a bogus tribunal that usurps the authority of the local bishops in the Holy See. But the society has actually set up a rival altar and a rival tribunal uh, within their own uh, structure uh, that usurps the authority of legitimate authorities by ruling on marriage cases, uh, marriage impediments, declarations of nullity, lifting of censures, dispensing of religious vows, etc. I mean, there's no more proof of a schismatic uh, mentality, I think, in my view, than that canonical tribunal. Um, I've talked about his repeated statements about how the Roman Catholic Church is no longer the Catholic Church. I mean, he, he's on record in 1991 of saying that jurisdiction comes from the people. I've talked about this before. It's in a letter he wrote to one of his priests in 91. Uh, this was condemned by Leo XIII, Pius IX. It's in, condemned in the St. Pius X Catechism, jurisdiction coming from the people. No, it comes from Christ and the Pope, depending on how you want to look at it. But he used that, Brian, to justify ordaining priests contrary to the 
uh, permissions of the Holy See, sending them out into dioceses without incarnation, and then ultimately the illicit and schismatic Episcopal consecrations. He had claimed that because the people needed these ministrations, they conferred upon him the authority to do these things, which again is heretical. It's plain and simple. It's heretical. On and on. Sacramental intention is another real problem in the traditional movement. You know, where did the idea come from, Brian, that the Novus Ordo sacraments are somehow invalid or at least of dubious validity? Where did that come from? You know where it came from? Archbishop Lefebvre. That's where that error started from, because he held a doctrinally erroneous view that the minister had to actually intend the sacramental effect. That is not true. It's contrary to, uh, to definitive Catholic teaching of the Holy Office. The minister only has to intend to do what the church does. When you read his letter to confused Catholics, he says if the priest, let's say, uh, while saying the mass, intends the sacrament to be transignification instead of transubstantiation, this brings into to, to question the validity of, of, of the Eucharist. That's, that's false. That's completely false. The Holy Office has said so long as the priest uses the proper form, intends to celebrate the rite as the church has it, the sacraments confected. And, and so uh, there, there are many more things that can be said, but I think the point here, Brian, is that there is this automatic uh, a priori position that the society is somehow orthodox just because the priests wear nice Catholic cassocks and they say the 62 missile. But <laughs> more than that, and, it, and, it, and it's just the opposite. People, once they understand that Lefebvre held serious doctrinal errors and heresies, I believe the dominoes are going to start to fall. And we're getting there. Some people are now beginning to see this, but nobody has really come out against Lefebvre in this manner. And it's not just me. There are a number of us out there who have studied the writings of Archbishop Lefebvre in great detail. And these are the conclusions that we've been inescapably reached. And they haven't been, they haven't been challenged to date. Yeah, I have a book. Um, I'm wondering if you read it. It's called, uh, it's by Patrick Madrid, and I can't see it on my shelf right now. I know it's there, but it's called. Uh, Long time ago, he wrote that book, but yeah, yeah. I, know, I know Patrick well. And Does it, do you think it's a, a, an accurate presentation of the Society of the St. Pius X? I only ask you because he talks about how, you know, they were under, um, they weren't an organization even yet within the church and they had to have six years of ad experimentum uh, time. And after that six years, if the Pope or the local Bishop approved, then they would go through six more years and then it would be a finalized society within the church. But the, the book goes on to talk about how they never made it to that final six years and it was never fully incorporated into the church in the first place. Is that accurate? Yeah, Patrick is right on. In fact, I did a, an hour and a half uh, podcast on this very issue, starting in 1970, you know, when the society was lawfully erected uh, under the 1917 Code of Canon Law as a pious union, right? Uh, which simply means a lay association, as the canonists explained under the old code, a lay association, because these were laymen, these were lay seminarians being formed by Archbishop Lefebvre into priests, who would then not be serving the society or incarnated into the SSPX, because after all, Archbishop Lefebvre did not have the ordinary jurisdiction to do so. The society was not a church or a personal prelature, if you will, a juridic person capable of receiving priests through incarnation. But the society's own statutes, Brian, say that everything depended upon the local bishop of Switzerland, who would be incarnating the priests that were ready for ordination into their diocese or other dioceses in union with the Roman pontiff. And so the society was lawfully erected as this lay association in 1970. And as Patrick correctly points out, uh, were suppressed prior to them making the six year ad experimentum period, which means they were only erected on a provisional basis. The Holy See and the local bishop wanted to see how this experiment went. And after Archbishop Lefebvre made his 1974 declaration, effectively declaring uh, his view that there was a distinction between eternal Rome and the Roman Catholic Church, by the way, a distinction condemned by Pius XII, um, the bishop said, wait a minute, this is going the wrong direction. We are no longer, we're not going to renew you. And then the Holy See intervened after the bishop suppressed the society and approved the suppression. 
So it's correct to say that this barely got off the ground. But whether the society was lawfully suppressed or not, and I can prove that it was lawfully suppressed, its canonical shelf life would have expired in 1976. And at that point, it was completely off the canonical map, if you will, even if it ever even was on it to, to, to begin with. So what you have today, Brian, is simply a, a consortium of Vegas uh, acephalous clergy without bishops with ordinary jurisdiction that wander around, primarily wander through the Roman rite, set up rival altars and chapels in dioceses, thereby usurping the authority of the of the bishops. And this is the problem. This is All while insulting the bishops. While attacking the bishops and attacking yeah. the Holy Mother Church. And this is why Cardinal Cassidy says, well, it is an internal matter of the church because the society is not even a church such as the Orthodox. They're not a juridic person uh, in, in, the, in, this, in the understanding of us, of them being even an ecclesial community. They're an organization completely separate and distinct. They're not on the canonical map. They're simply Vegas and wandering priests. And they're, you know, the solution to this is if the institution itself, if the society leadership itself will not renounce its errors and accept the profession of faith and accept the divine teaching of the church, Hopefully, at least some of the priests will leave that institution, go to bishops where they can be lawfully incarnated and carry out their ministry in a legitimate way. And that's kind of what happened with the FSSP and some others, right? They came back lawfully to the church? Well, yeah. I mean, after the consecrations in 88, we had a number of priests break off. They actually recognized what was happening. And some of these priests have been public about it. Uh, they couldn't reconcile the argument of necessity with the fact that the Holy See actually offered Archbishop Lefebvre a bishop to be consecrated on August 15th, 1988. And Archbishop Lefebvre both orally agreed to that and agreed to it in writing. And then the next day changed his mind and says, I want three more bishops six weeks earlier. There is no basis for an argument of necessity or emergency on that factual basis, you can't argue necessity because he was being given a bishop. He was being allowed to form priests in the old rites. He was going to be allowed to consecrate a bishop to perpetuate the apostolic succession within the old rite. I mean, he was given these things and yet rebelled against it. And this is why then we had priests saying, no, we're going to carry on the tradition to the extent the church needs it. But we're going to do this in union with the Holy Father, which is the way to do it, of course. Yeah, the priest who officiated my wedding is actually part of the FSSP, and he um, he tr tr celebrates the traditional Latin Mass perpetually, and uh, but it's within the church, and it's under obedience to the Holy Father. And it, you keep bringing that back. It's back to the St. Ignatius of Antioch, you know, <laughs> all throughout the entire history is if you don't have a valid bishop, if you don't have the bishop, if you don't, then you don't have the Catholic Church, you don't have Jesus. And that's a very serious thing. So, they were suppressed. Uh, Archbishop Lefebvre and his four seminarians were excommunicated. Uh, some people would say that, you know, but that was reversed because, you know, Pope Benedict, uh, you know, he he took away the excommunications. Why did he do that? Well, he took, took away the declared excommunications in order to facilitate a reconciliation with the society into the Catholic Church. And this is what Pope Benedict says. This is precisely what he says. It was a benevolent gesture to, to bring the society back because when one is under a declared excommunication, they're effectively in a spiritual straitjacket. They can do nothing without having that declared censure lifted. I mean, the society bishops couldn't even go to a, a, a confession and confess their sins because they were still under declared censure. So the first and necessary step for the society to be integrated into the church, if it would include those four bishops, was to lift the declared censure. But we have to remember that one can be in schism without the declared, without the censure being declared. Clerics have held, Archbishop Fulton Sheen held, in fact, publicly stated in a letter he wrote in 1978 that the Society of St. Pius X, and remember this was 10 years before the consecrations, Archbishop Sheen called the society, quote, a schismatical sect, okay? And that's because they had already withdrawn submission from the supreme authority and governance of, of the church. 
The declared censure imposes a, additional juridical consequences that must be lifted by the same authority or higher authority who imposed the censure. But that didn't mean that the society uh, weren't in schism before, and it doesn't mean that they're not in schism today. Of course, uh, those who formally adhere to the movement, uh, as John Paul II said, are excommunicated for schism. But the society itself as an institution, as an organization through its leadership has refused submission, has willfully refused to accept the conditions of integration in the church. They, by their own will, have refused submission to the governance of the Catholic Church. Again, that's the definition of schism. And there's no justification, whether it be a matter of faith or worship, that can justify the separation and governance. And that's why the institution itself would still be in schism. I was just about to ask about the uh, the schism aspect, because some people will say, you know, they're in partial communion. Some people have said that they have an irregular canonical status. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the controversy, I guess, of that? Why do some people say that they have a regular? Can what does that even mean? Well, regular comes from Latin regula, which means rule. And the, the rule of faith is that one must be part of a clergy, you know, must be part of the church and sent by the church to be legitimate. So when one says they have an irregular status, that means they have no status, which is exactly what Pope Benedict said when he lifted the excommunications. He says the Society of St. Pius X has no canonical status in the church. So irregular just means not according to the rule. Irregular means not regular. It means there is no canonical status. And that is because the society is not within the juridical structure of the church. They do not share the threefold bond of faith, worship, and governance, which is, re which, uh, is required to be in union with the church and, and the bishop and, and the Holy Father. And, and so, you know, irregular is a buzzword that's thrown around, but it means not regular. It means not in communion. You know, that's what struck me, too, when I was reading Benedict on uh, on this matter. It actually struck me that he, sp he was quite clear, so loving, like that he wanted them back into the communion with the church, but they refused. He offered them every opportunity to come back. And he even offered them to have their own right, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, he literally bent over backwards and they said, no, of course, because they know better. But, you know, the thing is that really struck me is that he said that they have no canonical status. He said they have no licit or active ministries. And he said, none of this can change until they come back into communion with Rome and fix their theological, major theological problems. He may have even used the word heresies. I'm not sure. But uh, that was the last as far as I know, that was the last authoritative uh, statement on the matter. And he said, it, none of that can change until they come back into communion with the Romans, submit themselves to Rome. So I don't see how they can think that they're in communion with the church if this still hasn't been the case. Again, because it's their Protestant ecclesiology, and I know that sounds harsh, but the, the, the fact of the matter is they've reduced the church to those who profess the true faith, which in their mind means adhering to everything pre-Vatican pre II, including the rights and disciplines of the church. That's how they define the church. That's literally Luther's argument. That's literally Luther was holding to the true uh, faith that had been perverted by Rome. I mean, all Protestants claim that. I hear it all the time. You know, when you read what Marcel Lefebvre said about the church, it's reading the playbook of the Protestants when he continually said Rome has lost the faith. Rome teaches a new religion. I mean, you can look at the quotes from Archbishop Lefebvre. He said over and over and over again, this is a new religion. Okay. Now, they want to say that they have not intentionally separated themselves from the Catholic Church. But what do you call an archbishop who says there's a distinction between the eternal Rome, which I'm a member of, and you, the juridical hierarchical you know, uh, structure in Rome, the diocese of Rome and all the churches in union with that, the Roman Catholic Church, there's a distinction there. I'm with eternal Rome. I reject present Rome because present Rome teaches a new religion. To me, that is evincing an intention to separate from the church and from everything that the church is post-Vatican II. So how could they First, oh, so many directions I want to go. Why would they say that they're in communion with the church in theory? Like, you know, oh, well, we we do obey the Pope or, we you know, we are in communion. But they, first of all, they don't want to. Why don't they just do their own thing and stop saying they're in communion when they are, everything they say is not in communion and everything they do is not in communion? Well, because they want to 
save themselves from being accused of being heretics. That, that's really the main reason. What I've concluded, Brian, in my study of there are many, many videos, and I, I watched just about all the videos on what they did. They called it the crisis series where many society priests, what they would do is the society priests, and this, this is a, a, a common uh, approach, they, they will make a correct profession of something. Uh, for example, they will profess that the church is a visible hierarchical uh, structure, a juridical structure, where ordinary jurisdiction comes from the pope to the bishops and there's canonical mission, et cetera. They will, they will say that. Okay, the Protestants wouldn't say that. So to that end, they're, they're closer to us. Okay, but that's an act of the speculative intellect. Okay, but on the practical side, the practical in, in, intellect, they don't resolve the, the inconsistency that they're not a part of that juridical structure, that they're separated from the juridical structure, that they don't have a canonical mission. Not so, only that, but they reject it in a sense. They reject it in practice. So there's a distinction there between what they what they practice and what they preach, as the old saying goes, right? They'll, they'll make a profession of what the church is, but then they don't reconcile for us the, uh, the issue of them not being a part of what they profess to be true. That's and those are called two contraries. They're actually professing two contraries, which cannot be reconciled. Either they don't believe one, or they acknowledge the other, and then are not part of the church. It's one or the other. And I, I guess you don't foresee them coming back into the church anytime soon. No, I, I don't. I mean, schism breeds schism, and if you think about. Uh, what happened in, in 2012 when we were very hopeful that uh, Bishop Fillet was going to accept the very reasonable conditions of the Holy Father and the Holy See for their integration, what happened? Well, there was a separation. Bishop Williamson either left or was expelled, but that was prompted by Bishop Fillet even approaching the Roman authorities and even compromising the true traditional faith. And how dare they say that the uh, the, the new right of Paul VI was legitimately promulgated and Vatican II doesn't contain heresies. So you see one schism led to another. Now Williamson is off. He's consecrated a number of bishops and, you know, schism breeds schism breeds schism. No, it's only when the leadership of the society is going to renounce their errors. It's not a question of, of Rome returning to the faith, but it's really a question of the society returning to the church. Uh, that there would be any type of integration. Otherwise, I think it will only be done on a you know, clergy by clergy basis, unfortunately. Yeah, it's really sad. And I think you're right. You know, I, I, I hear this all the time, like, oh, well, we hold the true faith. I'm like, well, you de definitely disagree with Sede Vecantis and they say they hold the true faith. And both of you have the best arguments, I feel like, against each other. When I read Sede Vecantis arguments against the SSPX, I'm like, wow, that is spot on. And when I read S S uh, SSPX arguments on Sede Vecantis, I'm like, wow, they, that's spot on too. You know, they, but neither of them can see it. I mean, since the earliest centuries, Coptics have claimed to have the true faith. And then the Orthodox, SSPX, Sede Vecantis, Protestants. I mean, it's been down the line. I don't, it doesn't make any sense. Um, so, we could have whole shows on this. Is this kind of just an overview today? But uh, maybe in closing, uh, I know you used to write for One Peter Five, and you know you decided to uh, depart ways with them. You know, can you talk a little bit about what's going on there? I mean, I know they were Vatic uh, reprimanded by the Vatican a few times. Their founder has kind of left not only the I think the faith. I, I don't even know if he believes in God anymore. It's like oh, it seems like there's a lot of problems over there, and it seems like they've become more and more radicalized over time. What are your thoughts on that? Well, they didn't tell me that I could no longer write for them, but I certainly. And I don't know that. I don't. I reached I'm just, that conclusion myself, though, Brian, because um, they initially wanted me to write. They, they, they at least told me that they thought the debate that we're having right now, this discussion that we're having, would be fruitful for the church and especially for the traditional community. Um, what I later discovered is that the leadership were completely sold out to the SPX and they were looking for anybody to, to expose me and refute me. Well, um, that didn't happen. And I think when they saw the debate going the other way and they were actually losing the written debate, they, they simply canceled me. Uh, that's, that's a fact. I mean, my, my, the first argument, uh, article I wrote for, for 1 Peter 5 was on supply jurisdiction. And the genesis of that article was my addressing Father Mauro Tranquilo of the Society's assertions that all clergy get supplied jurisdiction, even including say to the contest clergy. 
And I wrote uh, an extensive article on that. And, and by the way, this related to the research I had done on the society. I actually submitted my conclusions to canonists in Rome who confirmed that my conclusions were, were correct. This went into that article, but wow. Peter five actually required me to do is to excise any references to the society of St. Pius X or father tranquilo of the society. And I said, wait a minute, I'm actually addressing what the society's arguments are and they didn't want me to expose the society. So kind of a, an alarm bell went off there and I said, okay, I'll, I'll play along for now, but I really want to get the society's arguments out there and see if anybody can rebut them. So I then I wrote a second article dealing with canonical mission and three or four uh, rebuttal articles were, were launched and they only, only allowed me to, to address one of them. They substantially edited my work. They wouldn't allow me to address all of them. And then finally, I think the straw that, that broke the camel's back, as they say, is uh, I requested them to publish my article, which proves that the society masses do not fill, fulfill the Sunday obligation, uh, which again was uh, something that I conferred with Canon Nissan and even went to my local bishop, uh, Archbishop Jerome Listecki of the Archdiocese of Milwaukee, who is a canon lawyer, who gave me a definitive judgment in writing that my conclusion was correct for, for a number of reasons, mainly uh, that the society chapels are not considered churches which celebrate Catholic rites in the sense that the churches understood them. But uh, what happened there is 1 Peter 5 not only refused to publish my article proving that the society masses don't fulfill the Sunday obligation, but they later issued a statement saying that they believe the masses do fulfill the Sunday obligation, but without allowing any debate on the issue. They simply did not want to be contradicted on that. And that's where it kind of died. So I view that as unfortunate, uh, perhaps dishonest. But as we continue down this road, you know, perhaps more reasonable minds will want to to look into these matters more honestly and and, and have legitimate discussion and debate. But I don't think one Peter five does. I was thinking that too. I mean, if they're editing substantially your work and only putting in there what they want in there, and they're deleting other things and not allowing you to freely speak. I mean, if you want to debate, you want to hear both sides and follow the evidence wherever it leads, if you're being intellectually honest. I mean, I tell Protestants who attack the Catholic faith all the time, at least read a Catholic book, get our arguments right, then yeah. we can have a discussion. Stop presenting straw man arguments. But I guess if you already have something in your mind and that's all you want to do is prove that point, then you don't really want to hear the opposition. And to me, that's extremely sad. I mean, we have a long historical tradition in the church of intellectualism and education and following the truth wherever it leads. And I feel like in many Catholic circles, that's just going downhill. And it's really sad to me. Yeah, and, and that has been my approach, Brian. I, I've used the society's writings from, I've got, you know, Archbishop Lefebvre, pretty much all his books, as well as what material they've published on their website. So I'm simply using their own teachings. You know, you've referenced Patrick Madrid's book and, and, and others, but I'm really using the society's teachings because I want to know what they teach and what positions they hold. That's what needs to be evaluated in light of what the church teaches. Yeah, and what strikes me is that you had uh, canon lawyers in this country and in Rome verify your points, you know, and they didn't want to hear that. That's striking to me. Um, so, <laughs> so I guess one Peter five. Do you recommend that people still go there? I mean, I'm sure they have some good traditional arguments. I'm sure they have some good articles. I mean, I just maybe this is a controversial question, but do you recommend people go there since they seem to be digging in on the extremist side? I don't know enough about them, but based upon my experience, I would say no. I mean, if they're not allowing genuine debate on matters that truly concern the salvation of souls, think about what we're talking about here. We are talking about a matter that concerns salvation. That is whether a Catholic can leave the Roman Catholic Church, can leave her juridical structure and be ministered to priests that are not sent by the church, that aren't part of the Catholic Church, which is something the church has always prohibited. And so to the extent that any organization holds the position that one can do such things. No, we should have nothing to do with them. Not only that, we should call them out for their errors. Great. Thank you so much. And well said. Um, where can people find you? Or do you, you know, where could be, do you have a website? Do you have, you know, a book you want to advertise? Sure. They can uh, reach me at uh, true or false pulp.com. That's our website. That's where Robert Sisko and I are putting out uh, our articles dealing with the society, dealing with state of the dealing with 
uh, Beneplanism, you know, this issue that people think Benedict's the Pope and a lot of the uh, current areas that are flicking, you know, the, the so-called traditional movement. That's where we're spending most of our time. So people can look at our work on the website and, and they can email me through the website as well. Great. Thank you so much for joining us on our podcast today. We appreciate you coming on. Thanks so much, Brian. And thank you all for joining us as well. Thank you for tuning in to the end. We appreciate this. And we ask you to share this video because this message needs to get out there. And uh, definitely check out John Saltz's information. We will link it in the description section below. And definitely follow Catholic Truth below on our social media, our podcast, our YouTube as well. And if you'd like to support us, our Patreon and our PayPal are below as well. Thank you all for watching and God bless you. Hi everyone, my name is Kate. I'm the video editor here at Catholic Truth, and I just wanted to say on behalf of all of us, thank you so much for taking some time to watch our videos and learn more about your faith. You guys really make this channel possible, and we truly appreciate you being here. So thanks again, and God bless.